Today I want to talk to you about the rapture debate and John Darby. The rapture debate and John Darby. Now listen very carefully. This may seemingly be an unimportant topic to you, but if you are a student of Bible prophecy, if your desire is to learn Bible prophecy, you need to carefully listen today because if you believe in the rapture of the church and in the chronology of the rapture taking place before the tribulation period, sooner or later someone is going to approach you with the John Darby debate, oftentimes called the John Nelson Darby debate. It is a criticism that is often brought against the theology of the rapture and sadly there's little uh, concise teaching on it. And so if you are a serious student of the Bible, you must be a serious student of Bible prophecy. If you're a serious student of Bible prophecy, you also need to know not only what you believe, but why you believe it. And so I know that the name John Darby for many of you is a first. You're hearing it right now for the first time. But again, sooner or later, if you're witnessing to people, if you're sharing your views on Bible prophecy and the chronology of the end time events, someone eventually is going to bring to your attention the John Darby debate and you need to understand what it is and how to answer it. We're going to go into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading at verse 13 and read through verse 18. Anytime I teach on the rapture, I like to refer you to one of the main biblical passages that identifies the rapture, because many new students of the Bible uh, do not know. Where do I find the rapture in the Bible? It's often said, I can't find the word rapture in my Bible. And if you have an English translation of the Bible, you will not find the word rapture in the Bible. It is referred to in our text that I'm about to read as the catching up of the bride of Christ or the sudden snatching away of the saints of God, both those who have died and those who are alive at the time of this event. And so let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. There the Bible says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will be raised from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And as you've heard me say so many times, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. And the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is an event called the rapture of the church. And today we're going to be discussing that and I trust in boldening your faith and encouraging you with the blessed hope of the church as we always do before we begin. Let me take time to pray with you. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up the sacred scriptures, uh, I humble my heart in your holy presence, and I ask that the anointing of the Lord would lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray that you would help me to carefully and clearly communicate the truth of the Bible and help people to understand. I pray that as these biblical truths in these last days are under great attack, I pray that people would remain solid in their faith, unmoved, unwavering in their commitment to Christ. And above all, I pray that every single listener would live ready to meet the Lord. I pray that if there are those who are listening who have wandered away from God, perhaps backslidden, perhaps entered back into a life of sin and feel like God cannot forgive them, let today be a day when people return to the Lord, repent of sin, and make sure of their salvation. When the invitation is given in the moments to come, I pray that you'd give people the faith and the courage to pray, to make peace with God, and to make this a day where they settle every account with God. We'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. One of the unambiguous teachings found in the New Testament of the Bible is the future promise of the rapture of the church. Now there will be those who will disagree perhaps with the timing of the rapture, but to say that I don't believe in the rapture is to make yourself an opponent of the clearly taught truth contained in the Word of God. And though the Bible clearly promises us this catching up of the believers, this future prophetic event that we understand is signless. There are no specific prophecies that help us to know the exact timing. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, the Bible says in Matthew at the 24th chapter. And yet within the fellowship of Bible-believing Christians, the subject of the rapture is one of the most hotly debated theological issues. And almost without exception, every Bible-believing evangelical denomination affirms their belief in the promised return of Christ. That is not what is debated. Again, almost without exception, every Bible-believing evangelical denomination in their written creed of faith, they all agree in the promised return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's when you begin to debate and discuss the when and the how of Christ's promised return, then there is a wide variety of opinions and views and debates, and in some circles, which there should not be, uh, arguments as to exactly how all of this is going to unfold. Sadly, and uh, thankfully not in great measure, but sadly there are those who deny even the rapture of the church. And uh, you basically have to start tearing out multiple passages out of your Bible if you're going to say, I don't believe that there is a rapture defined anywhere in the Bible. Uh, there are actually seven raptures in the Bible. Many of those are types and shadows that lead us up to the significant or the final prophetic rapture of the church. But there are many raptures in the Bible. So to say that you don't believe in the rapture is pretty much an admission that you have not been a serious student of the Bible. And so I want to ask the question, why would you not want to better understand end time events, Bible prophecy, if for no other reason these Bible studies that we produce will not only help you to better understand prophecy passages and prophetic events and so on, 
but perhaps more importantly, they'll prepare you on how to navigate these last days in which we live. And as Paul in our text said, it is a message of comfort. When you don't understand some of these details of future prophetic events, then it's easy to become discouraged or fearful or to worry or to wonder how things are going to turn out. But Paul made it clear that prophecy was not a message of fear. It was a message of faith. And he encouraged believers comfort one another with these words. So in our study today, here's what I'd like to do. I only want to answer one common question that is oftentimes addressed to me by our growing family of international Bible students. And the question that I'm going to focus on that was sent in reads like this, quote, Who is John Darby and is it true that the pre-tribulational view of the rapture was invented by John Darby in 1830? That was the question, and I get multiple questions that basically are all asking the same thing. Again, sooner or later, if you're a student of Bible prophecy, if you discuss Bible prophecy, if you witness and share your faith and help people, pointing them to Bible prophecy and pointing them to being prepared to meet the Lord, I promise you someone is going to come up to you if you believe that the rapture takes place before the tribulation and they're going to say, you do realize that that is not in the Bible. That was invented by John Darby in the 1830s. And I promise you, sooner or later, when I travel around the world, when I travel and speak, uh, almost without exception, there is hardly ever a trip where somebody doesn't come up to me and say, I can't believe that you teach that the rapture is taking place before the tribulation. Don't you know that was invented, and I finished the sentence for them, by John Darby in 1830. I can't tell you how many times I've heard it through the years, but yet I can tell by this growing international audience that many are asking questions. So either you have never heard of it before or people have confronted you. And some of you have actually written in and said exactly that. Tiff, I've been sharing your Bible studies. I've uh, shared some of your YouTube videos. I've referred your podcast channel. And Christians are getting back to me and they're asking me about John Darby. What's that all about? So with that question in mind, let's get into the meat of our Bible study. I oftentimes teach you and to all of our new students, listen carefully and write it down in your life notes. If you desire to be a serious student of the Bible, you must be a serious student of Bible prophecy, or as it's oftentimes called in the academic world, eschatology, the study of end time and future events. The Bible has 31,124 verses. Uh, feel free to sit down one day and check to see if my information is accurate. But the Bible has 31,124 verses. Did you know that 8,352 of those verses include prophecies and specific predictions. That represents 27% of your Bible. In the New Testament, one out of every 30 verses has to do with prophecy and future events. So if 27% of our Bible is prophecy, Christians who desire to be students of the Scripture must be students of Bible prophecy and have a desire to learn them and to live them. So if you want to be a serious student of Bible prophecy, 
then you also need to possess a fundamental understanding of the theology of the rapture and you must also possess a fundamental understanding of the criticisms that are brought against the rapture. Because, listen very carefully when I tell you this. Sadly, many Christians do a fairly good job of telling people what they believe. But when they are asked why they believe, many of them are not able to answer those who have questions. And so one of the, I pray, benefits of following along with me in the Bible is that I spend the bulk of our time not just teaching you what we believe, but putting a great deal of time and effort and energy into teaching you why you believe. Because if you do not know why you believe, then what you believe can be lost by the first argument that you can't explain. Someone can rob you from what you believe if you don't know why you believe it. So I always make it clear that understanding what you believe is one thing, but far better to understand why you believe it. Now one more thing that I want to lay down as we get into the details of this teaching that also is vitally important, and that is you've often heard me say that in multiple teachings that we present to you, that there has to be, listen carefully, there has to be a measure of grace and humility extended to fellow Christians who may hold differing views on the chronology of Bible prophecy. Let me state that again because <clears throat> I really find this not only as a quote unquote golden rule, I find it a necessary part of being Christ-like. If you're a Christian, you should have a desire to be Christ-like. And part of being Christ-like is you cannot adopt a condescending attitude to other members of the body of Christ. Just because somebody holds a different view than you. Now, I'm not talking about essential doctrines. If someone says Jesus is not the Son of God, or uh, there is only salvation available uh, to this race of people, but not to all races of people, and and uh, the blood that Jesus shed has nothing to do with having right relationship with God. And Jesus wasn't the Son of God. Now, if people are going to deny essential doctrines, then that's actual evidence that they're not a brother or a sister in Christ. One of the proofs of a true Christian is we all agree on the fundamentals, the essential doctrines. Uh, for example, salvation through Christ alone, obtained by grace. That is never up for debate. But when it comes to Bible prophecy and eschatology, there are some differences of views and opinions as to the chronology or to the unfolding as to when these final events are going to take place. And there always must be now, I hope I'm doing a better job of this as I have grown older. Uh, this year we're entering into our 44th year of full-time ministry. And I will openly confess and admit to you uh, that when I was younger, I was perhaps a little more dogmatic and a little more unbending. And what I believed, I almost felt like I had this God-given responsibility to uh, die on that hill of belief. But as I've grown older, I've realized that to truly be Christ-like, when you have differences of opinions on some of the subcategories of theological issues, there needs to be a grace and there needs to be a humility. And I pledge to you that if you follow us as a Bible teacher, I'll always try to extend that to you. And I would ask that you would extend it to me. Uh, it doesn't always happen. Uh, there are many people, I, I don't read all of the comments, and again, forgive me, I cannot read 
all of the comments that come in. You can imagine, and the number is ever growing, but in 17 million views, you can imagine how many comments there are because for every uh, view and for every video, there's a myriad of comments and questions. But many times, Christians will vilify me or try to demean me because I have a, a different view than that they may have. And usually I don't have to read too long, and I, I don't say this in a, in a condescending way, but oftentimes it's people that have little formal theological education. And I'm not saying that if you don't have formal theological education that you're not a worthy student of the Bible. I'm just saying that one of the signs of immaturity, and oftentimes when I ask them, what formal training do you have? Uh, you know, their answer is, you know, well, that shouldn't be important. What the Bible says is what the Bible says. And many of the people that demean and attack and vilify and don't show grace and don't show humility are actually giving a testimonial to their own Christian weakness and their own Christian testimony. So if you're going to be a student of this ministry, and if you consider me a spiritual voice in your life, and some write on a regular basis. They're in parts of the world where they have no pastors or they have no churches. And many people write to me and say, you're my only way of learning the Bible. I consider you my spiritual father. Well, if in any way you respect and receive this ministry, then I want you as a son or a daughter in the faith to be a person who learns to walk in grace and humility. And so as we discuss a differing view today, I'm going to extend that grace and humility, whether or not it'll be reciprocated by the thousands of people who will listen to this in the days and weeks and months ahead, remains to be seen. Let's get right into the question. Who is John Nelson Darby, and is it true that his pre-tribulational view of the rapture was invented in the 1830s. Now to properly address this question, and you're going to learn some things. We're going to learn more than who John Darby is. That's not even really the point of the message. It's just a question that comes up. And when the question comes up, it takes us into the scripture that demands a proper answer. And so we're not going to devote a lot of time to the history of who John Nelson Darby is. And by the way, he was a believer. He was a a godly man. He was a respected theologian. And he wrote much about eschatology and end time events. And he did write a lot about the pre-tribulation view of eschatology. But many times it is stated he invented it in 1830. And because he invented it in 1830, which isn't true, because he invented it in 1830, that is proof that it was not a substantial doctrine that should be espoused by Bible-believing Christians today. They'll say it's just a new or a modern view. It didn't even exist until 1830. And so if you believe the rapture takes place prior to the tribulation, don't you know that you're holding to a view that nobody even espoused until 1830 and it was made popular by John Nelson Darby? Again, not true but we're going to break this down into three pieces. If you're going to properly understand that, here are the three pieces that we're going to discuss today before we pray. Number one, I want to answer, what is the rapture? Because there are so many new students that are listening to me who have recently been saved through the ministry of the outreaches of Lost Lamb and our ministry and the places that we preach, and they're brand new Christians. Many of them write and say, I just bought a Bible for the very first time in my life. And so if you're a student of mine, you know that we always try to start from square one and move forward. So question number one, we're going to break this down into three bite-sized pieces. Number one, what is the rapture? Number two, what is the pre-tribulation view of the rapture? And number three, who is John Darby? And so if you're taking notes, number one, <clears throat> what is the rapture. The rapture of the church 
is an event in which God snatches away or suddenly catches up the believers, all believers, from the earth in order to make way for His righteous judgment that will be outpoured upon the earth during a period of time called the tribulation. Now, write that down in your notes. Let me give it to you again, and I'll try to say it a little slower, because I want every one of you to understand at least fundamentally, if somebody asks you, what is the rapture? You should be able to give an answer. So let me give it to you again a bit slower. The rapture of the church is an event in which God snatches away all believers from the earth in order to make a way for His righteous judgment to be poured out upon the earth during a period of time called the tribulation. And I always, when I teach on the rapture, I give you the three main passages. And so for those of you who have been students of mine for a long period of time, you already have this. But for all of the new students, there are three main passages in the New Testament that talk to us and teach us the rapture of the church. The first one is found in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. The rapture is a New Testament event, and so though we have some prophecies in the Old Testament that give us foreshadowing, the main passages are in the New Testament. The first, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. The second passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. And then I read to you as our text the third, and that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18. So again, if you're taking notes, the three main rapture passages in the New Testament, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 55, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And I read that passage to you. Now, just briefly, I have an entire video on this if you want great detail. But to answer the question, the word rapture is not found in my Bible. No, it's not. If you have an English Bible, it is not found in the English Bible. But if you'll look at our text that I read to you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, go down to verse 17 in your Bible. There the scripture says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth... Now, verse 16, just as a little bit of context, in the rapture, the first that are caught up are the saints who have died. Saints who have died are going to be taken in the rapture, and the Bible says they'll be caught up first. And then in verse 17, it says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And highlight, and if you've been a student of mine, I'll guarantee you that you've about worn it out of your Bible. But highlight the two words, caught up. Because if the word rapture offends you, I always tell people, then use the exact phrase out of 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 where we are caught up in the twinkling of an eye as far as the timing goes. It's not going to be a slow, unfolding event, but suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, the Greek text, the original Greek text, the word for suddenly or the twinkling of an eye is atomos, which is where we get the word atom. Immediately caught up. 
The word rapture is just a theological term. We know that in the Greek, caught up is herpazo, but from the Latin, it's rapio, which is where we get the root of the word rapture. And so many people who speak English or have an English version of the Bible, they say the word rapture is not in my Bible, therefore anybody preaching or teaching on the rapture is a heretic. Well, I've said it before, I'll say it again. How obnoxiously arrogant for those who speak English and have an English version of the Bible to believe that every Christian in the world has to answer to the English translation of the Bible. We answer always, we answer always to the original text and the original text of the Bible, Old Testament, Hebrew, New Testament, Greek and Aramaic, but by and large the New Testament is in Greek. And so in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17, caught up from the Greek is her pazo, from the Latin Vulgate, written by a theologian by the name of Jerome in A.D. 400, the word rapio, which is where we get the theological term rapture. So just in a nutshell, that's where we get the word rapture. Again, if you want to be pharisaical and legalistic about it, feel free to call it the catching up of believers. That's fine with me. Question number two, what is the pre- tribulation view of the rapture. Now we've already defined what is the rapture. The second subsequent progressive question in our teaching today that unfolds out of that question is what is the pre-tribulation rapture view? Because again, all evangelical Bible-believing denominations have in their creed or have in their statement of faith, they believe in the second coming of Christ. Over 400 times in the Bible, the second coming of Christ was prophesied. So unless people are going to absolutely deny that the Bible is God's holy word and without error, you can't deny that and call yourself a Bible-believing Christian. It's the timing that many people, the what and the when, that people have various views upon. Let me give you a definition, if you're taking notes, of the pre-tribulation rapture view. The pre-tribulation rapture view, or the catching up of the saints, teaches that the church will be raptured before, key word, before the seven-year tribulation begins. That's the most simplistic definition of the pre-tribulation view that you can put into your notes. The pre-tribulation view of the rapture or the catching up of the saints, again, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, teaches that the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. The tribulation will begin at some point after the rapture and will officially begin. We know the exact day that the tribulation begins. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 gives us the biblical, prophetic, official starting date of the tribulation period, which is exactly seven years in length. And not seven years by our calendar of 365 days, but by the ancient calendar or the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. The exact day that the tribulation begins is in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. There the Bible tells us that a man who is identified as the Antichrist will sign a peace treaty in Israel with the Jewish people and this peace treaty will be for a period of seven years years. And that seven years, by the way, is in Daniel's vision. Daniel is a prophet in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament is a counterpart of the book of Revelation in the New Testament, two of the most significant prophecy books in the Bible. Daniel in the Old Testament, Revelation in the New Testament. And Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 gives us a detailed vision 
of what is called the vision of Daniel's 70 weeks. I have an entire teaching on that on our YouTube and podcast channel. Listen to it when you have an opportunity. And it's one of those teachings that you need to listen to repeatedly, five times, 10 times, 20 times. Listen to it until you have it in your heart. But in Daniel 70 weeks, which is 70 sets of seven literal years, the final seven years or the 70th week is the tribulation. And the rapture takes place before the tribulation period. Those of us, and I do, those of you, if you want to ask outright, I openly, I teach a pre-tribulational view of the rapture, a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial rapture of the church. That is what we believe the weight of scholarship supports. That's why I spend uh, multiple hours teaching and providing content for you to study it and to prove it, not from my view, but to prove it from the scripture. Uh, The pre-tribulation view again, believes that the rapture takes place before the seven years of tribulation. Again, if you don't already have it in your notes or if you're a new student, the tribulation begins, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The official biblical prophetic start of the seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist will sign a peace treaty, most likely in Jerusalem, in Israel, with the Jewish people, And the tribulation begins that day. The tribulation ends with the second coming of Christ. So that is the pre-tribulation view of the rapture. Lastly, and we'll close with this, who is John Darby? Now, one of the most common objections to the pre-tribulation rapture view is that it can't be right It can't be biblical because it didn't even arrive onto the scene until the 1830s through the teaching and through the ministry of an Irish brethren preacher named John Nelson Darby. And as I've already mentioned, I have had hundreds, and that's a conservative underestimation. I have had untold numbers of people through the years once they find out that I preach and teach the literal pre-tribulational rapture of the church before the tribulation, the church is not going through the tribulation and so on. Once I begin to preach that and teach that, invariably there are more than one. Where I was just at, there were two that came to me and one of the common debates, one of the common objections is they'll say, you do know that the pre-tribulational view of the rapture was not even taught anywhere until 1830, and it originated with John Darby. Now again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time highlighting John Nelson Darby, other than to tell you he was an Irish brethren minister. He was a devout man. He was a godly man. He was a true scholar. He was a respected theologian, and it is true that John Nelson Darby wrote a lot on the subject of the position of the pre-tribulation rapture. That is true. But those who say that doctrine can't be espoused because it didn't arrive until the 1830s with John Darby, that is a myth. It simply is not true. And their argument often goes like this. Uh, How come it didn't appear in early church history? Well, first of all, let me just stop right here and let's, let's clarify something of gold value in interpreting Scripture. The date of something, or when it was discovered, is not the single most important test of biblical doctrine. The single most important test of the teaching and the doctrine of the Bible is what did the Bible say? Specifically, 
what did the original authors from the original manuscripts, the original text, what did they say? That is the gold standard as to how we interpret all theology, all biblical teaching. Not by when somebody discovered it or when somebody wrote about it or when a book was written. I mean, for goodness sakes, there wasn't even a printing press until modern history. So the argument from date is not really an argument. Now, when books were written, for example, there's great debate as to, for years, I mean, that debate is not really hotly contested now, but those who believe in a, a view of theology and in eschatology called preterists, and I'm not going to define that today, we'll deal with that in another teaching, but the entire preterist view of eschatology hinges upon the book of Revelation being written uh, prior to 70 uh, A.D. 70. Now, through time, we now know that that's not true. We now know, almost without debate, I mean, there's still some that try to hang on to the old dating because they have to somehow hold on to that to support some of their inerrant views on the chronology of Bible prophecy. But the book of Revelation was written in 95 A.D. We now know that almost without exception. That is accepted by modern scholarship. The dating of Revelation, A.D. 95. So dates of books can come up in uh, theology discussions, but I'm talking about theology, the teaching of the rapture. What matters most is what did the Bible say? Now, I'm not going to take the time to bore you with the details. There's three main arguments that I'm going to give you and then we're going to pray. But if I had time, if I were uh, teaching this at the Bible College, and if I were teaching this as an eschatology course, I would thoroughly go over it with the students. But in 150 AD, the rapture idea was preached by the shepherd of Hermas. We understand and have testimonial to that now. We didn't always have that, but as time goes by, more documents are discovered, more manuscripts are discovered, and so on. But we know that the rapture, pre-rapture, pre-trib rapture idea was veiled in some of the teaching of the shepherd of Hermas in 150 A.D. In 270 A.D., uh, Victorinus, uh, the bishop of Patal, a Catholic leader, taught it in 350 A.D. Ephraim the Syrian taught it in 400. Jerome in the Latin Vulgate. Then there was almost a thousand years of silence called the Dark Ages, and then it came back again in 1304. Uh, Reverend Dolcino proclaimed a pre-tribulation uh, rapture view in 1400. Bible translations in native tongues uh, began to uh, propagate the pre-trib rapture view in 1627. Joseph Mead wrote about it. Uh, Increase Mather in 1627, 1687, Peter Giraud, 1700, John Asgill, 1738, Philip Doddridge, 1748, John Gill, 1763, James McKnight, 1744, Morgan Edwards, 1792, Thomas Scott, and then 1836, John Nelson Darby. So I, I ran through that. I don't expect you to retain all of that doesn't matter to me if you put it all in your life notes or not. I'm just telling you from my 44 years of research and study on the subject, when somebody says that the pre-tribulation rapture was never taught, it was invented in 1830s by John Nelson Darby, I just have to shake my head and make a decision to exercise humility and grace. Uh, I understand that anybody that holds to that position uh, has not done their due diligence in researching historic documents, and it just simply is not true. But I'm going to close. I just want to give you uh, three main arguments, because I do feel if you're going to be a serious student of Bible prophecy, you should have something in your life notes to answer the John Nelson, uh, John Nelson Darby debate. I promise you, sooner or later, you're going to meet somebody who's going to challenge you on that. So let's close with these three things. Write these down. Number one, pseudo 
Ephraim. And uh, you spell that P-S-E-U-D-O dash E-P-H-R-A-E-M. Pseudo Ephraim is how that's pronounced. And what that is, the earliest extra biblical evidence of the pre-tribulation rapture position surfaced in the early medieval, medieval period in a sermon titled, Sermon on the End of the World. And that sermon is oftentimes attributed to Ephraim the Syrian. But uh, there's debate among scholars believe that it was the product of someone known as Pseudo Ephraim. And I'll not uh, get into the debate. It was not uncommon for people to use uh, various names and authorship, just like authors do today. There are many authors, you buy their books, it's not their legal birth name. They wrote under that name. This is the case with Pseudo Ephraim. But in that sermon, uh, it was written, uh, they don't know the exact time. They know that it was written after the 4th century, before the 6th century, but according to prophecy, prophecy scholars Dr. Thomas Ice and Dr. Timothy Demi, a pseudo Ephraim clearly presented three important facts that pointed to a pre tribulation rapture. Number one, in that document, there are two distinct comings clearly taught in that document. The return of Christ to rapture the saints followed later by the second coming of Christ. Secondly, that document taught a defined interval between the two comings. And thirdly, that document taught that there was a clear statement that Christ would remove the church before the tribulation. So that sermon by Pseudo Ephraim is clear evidence of a pre-tribulation rapture doctrinal statement over a thousand years before John Nelson Darby. Number two, uh, another document written by a man that was called Brother Dolcino. Uh, in 1300, after the leader uh, of the Apostolic Brethren Movement, which was a devout Christian movement in northern Italy, they were Italian, the leader in 1300 was burned at the stake. A man by the name of Brother Dolcino took over leadership of that movement. Under the leadership of Brother Dolcino, the order grew and eventually numbered in the thousands. But what we know from Brother Dolcino and his writings and his left life notes that were left behind, translated, is that he strongly believed in the message of eschatology, gave much time to praying, reading, studying, and writing on end time events. And he died, Brother Delcino, he died in 1307. In 1316, a notary of the diocese of Vercelli in northern Italy wrote a treatise in Latin that set forth all of the teachings of eschatology written by Brother Delcino. This treatise was called The History of Brother Delcino. Several points, and I'm just going to go through them quickly, but three things that are very clear in Delcino's teaching. Number one, when you study his teaching, he taught that Christians, uh, the word that we would use, transferred. From the Latin, Delcino taught Christians would be transferred. From the Latin, it was the exact same word that was used for the rapture of Enoch in the Old Testament. And so Del Chino clearly taught all the way back in the 1300s that Christians would be raptured. Secondly, the purpose of the rapture Del Chino taught was to preserve people from the persecution of the Antichrist. And the text also taught the transference of believers to heaven and the descent of the believers from heaven as two distinct separate events. And then thirdly, his text taught us that there was quite a gap of time between the rapture of the saints into heaven and the return of the saints from heaven. 
These are three of the fundamental uh, pillars of the theology and the view of the rapture of the church before the tribulation. Uh, Francis Gummerlock, he was uh, considered an expert of Dolcino's texts, wrote this, quote, The paragraph from history of Brother Dolcino indicates that in northern Italy, in the early 14th century, a teaching akin to pre-tribulation wisdom was being preached, responding to some very distressing political and ecclesiastical conditions. Chino was engaged in detailed speculations about Christian eschatology and believed that the coming of the Antichrist was imminent. He also believed that the means by which God would protect his people from the persecution of the Antichrist in tribulational period would be through a translation of the saints to paradise. Again, another notable example of someone who taught pre-tribulation rapture view long before John Nelson Darby. Let me give you one more and then we'll pray. The third one that I'd like for you to have in your notes is a man by the name of Morgan Edwards. Morgan Edwards lived from 1722 until 1795. He's best known as a Baptist scholar who founded Brown University. Uh, most of you would be familiar with Brown. Brown is one of the most elite Ivy League schools in the world, not far from Harvard, Brown University, not far from where my wife and I attended Bible College in Providence, Rhode Island. Edwards believed in a distinct rapture before the start of the millennium. Edwards first wrote about his pre-tribulation beliefs in 1742, and they were later published in 1788. Think of that. The founder of Brown University was not only a Christian, not only a scholar, not only a theologian, but documented his belief in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Edwards made three essential points. One, he clearly separates the rapture from the second coming. Two, he used modern pre-tribulation rapture verses to distinguish and describe the rapture, support his view, and thirdly, he believed that the judgment seat of Christ for all believers will occur in heaven while the tribulation rages here on earth. All pillar truths and teachings of the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, the only notable difference between modern pre-tribulationism and Edwards' beliefs is the time interval between the rapture and the second coming. So as we conclude our study, what I really want you to know as a student of the Bible, as a student of Bible prophecy, and if you believe, as I believe strongly, that the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon the rapture of the church taking place prior to the tribulation, as I often say, it is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God. So in conclusion, the idea that the pre-tribulation rapture is a recent invention and no one ever taught it before John Nelson Darby in the 1830s is a straw man argument. It has been completely dismantled and anyone still using the John Nelson Darby argument has not been a student of modern findings, modern reading, and documents unveiled of church historians. It is well documented. Uh, I took the time, probably bored you to tears in doing so, but I took the time to read you all the way from the Shepherd of Harmas in AD 150 all the way up until John Darby, multiple examples of individuals who wrote in the fashion of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now I know that this is not a teaching uh, that is for uh, the faint of heart, but it is content that I want you to have in your studying of Bible prophecy and eschatology, because again, I not only want you to know what you believe, I want you to know why you believe it. 
And so this argument of John Nelson Darby inventing the pre-tribulational view is simply not historically accurate. It has been refuted and debunked thoroughly, and anyone who still holds on to it, we're not demeaning them, we're just telling you anyone who is still holding on to the John Nelson Darby view as the creator of the pre-tribulation rapture view simply is reading old materials and needs to update their library. There is absolutely no position in any way, shape, or form that in this current age supports the John Nelson Darby accusation against the pre-tribulation view of the rapture. With all of that said, I oftentimes conclude some of these more detailed studies by saying if you only learn one thing from me, here's what I'd like for you to learn. That would be Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44. It says, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. The single most important thing to learn about Bible prophecy is that you need to turn from sin, turn to Christ, and live every day ready for His promised soon return. Again, over 400 times in the Bible, we are promised the return of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't figured it out by now, we are surely living in the final moments of human history as the political systems of our country and the world are preparing the stage for the arrival of a man the Bible calls the Antichrist, and you need to live ready to meet the Lord. If you're not certain of that, or if you've wandered away, every time I teach, I pray with you. Will you pray with me today? Will you make peace with God today? Will you make sure in your heart, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Three things everyone has to do according to the Bible, to be forgiven, to have right relationship with God, to know that your salvation is sure. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Will you come to Christ today? Wherever you're at, Whatever you've done, whatever your past, God's grace is available. Pray right now. Just pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to know my sins are forgiven and forgotten. I want to live ready for your soon return. And so I recognize my sin and I repent. I turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I vow this day I will serve you all the days of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. According to God's grace, today I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen.